Hello. My name is Eliza Sylvia, and I am currently a graduate student here at the University of Guelph. I would like to welcome you to the College of Social and Applied Human Sciences Convocation Ceremony this morning. The University of Guelph is honored by our graduates, and we take great pride in this convocation. I'd like to tell you a little bit about the proceedings today. The ceremonials used for the conferring degrees have evolved over a millennium, and, have, and the gowns and hoods represent that history. In general, the gowns for the baccalaureate and magisteriate degrees are black, and the color of the hood is different for each degree program. The doctorates at the University of Guelph have a bright blue gown, and the honorary degrees are red. The University of Guelph, Guelph crest that you can see on the curtains behind me and shown on the cover of the convocation program also represents our specific history. The emblems in the crest show links with the royal city of Guelph through the white stallion above, the connection to liberal arts through the book, to the sciences through the astrolobe, and our connection to abundance and agriculture through the cornucopia. The University of Guelph motto, Rerum Cognoscare Cosas, is a quote from Virgil. It is variously translated to be either happy is the one who is able to ascertain the reasons of things, or perhaps to know the meaning of things. The procession of people into the hall are also influenced by ancient tradition. The piper will herald the start of the procession of graduates, the students who are here to graduate today. This will be followed by the arrival of the mace leading the platform party. The mace is a symbol of authority of the university and will be carried by the beetle. In medieval universities, the beetle was chosen by the instructor to work as an assistant. Today, the beetle is ceremonial officer of state. Following the beetle and mace is the chancellor and vice chancellor, members of the administration and the honorees, fellows of the university, members of the board and senate, and members of faculty and staff. The degrees will be conferred in the order that you see in your program. The degrees are separated by categories representing the specific degree being awarded within the college. We will begin with doctorates and magisteriates followed by the bac baccalaureate degrees. The name reader will present the scholars to the vice chancellor by degree category. As the name of each student is called, the beetle will place the hood over the recipient's shoulders. This moment will be videoed and technology willing, there will be a simultaneous live cast of the event to allow family members and friends to watch from a distance. The vice chancellor will greet each student at the center stage and a photograph will be taken. We understand the joy and excitement accompanying such an auspicious occasion, but we ask that you hold your applause until after each group of graduates has crossed the stage. There will be an, op an opportunity for truly thunderous applause. Once all of the degrees are conferred and all the cheers are cheered, the Chancellor will close the ceremony and a recessional will play. Please remain standing during the recessional until all of the platform party has processed out of the hall. Our colleagues from the Alumni Affairs are hosting a social media program developed especially for convocation. Please share your photos, memories, and advice with graduating students by joining us on social media and using the hashtag GuelphGrad. Finally, May I be the first person to congratulate the graduates on their various successes and offer my congratulations to the family and friends who are here to support them. Welcome to Convocation at the University of Guelph.
Oh, Canada, our home and native land, true patriot love in all of us command. With glowing hearts we see thee rise, the true north strong and free. From far and wide, O oh Canada, we stand on guard for thee. God, keep our land glorious and free. O oh Canada, we stand on guard for thee. O oh Canada, we stand on guard for thee. While you are standing, please consider in your heart for one moment the land on which you stand. Join me to acknowledge and thank the diverse indigenous peoples whose footsteps have marked this territory for centuries, such as the Atawandarin, Haudenosaunee, and Anishinaabe peoples. Now that you're pretty well grown and nearly graduated, you'll discover that in pretty well every thorny situation, you're either part of the problem or part of the solution, and you will have to make up your mind. Like the fellow who was a horrible chain smoker, and one day he happens upon an article that explains the medical effects of his addiction. He's traumatized and terrified, just beside himself. He is so scared he can hardly breathe. Right there and then, he makes the resolution and speaks it out unequivocally. He clears his throat and he says, from now on, from now on, I will never, ever read another article about smoking again. <laughs> so this fellow decided to be part of the problem. Charles Dickens, in his book, A Tale of Two Cities, writes, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. For some cosmic reason, these two extremes seem to come together throughout history. Whenever the world's population is vulnerable to what seems to be a clash of cultures, wanton violence, and unspeakable horrors, it gives birth to a strange bedfellow, an overwhelming sense of compassion for one another and transcendent feeling that all of humankind is one. Hardly a week goes by when we open the newspapers and are shocked by incomprehensible pain and suffering. Our heart opens and we feel so deeply for our fellow man and woman. We can't sit back and do nothing. So perhaps we post on Facebook, attend a rally, and maybe even join a political group, feeling that we've done our part. Allow me to share two game-changing secrets. First, the most powerful way to transform others is to transform yourself. Parents, educators, and mentors who are well experienced in their craft know this all too well. And now, you know it too. Secret number two, never underestimate the immense power of a single act of kindness and compassion. Every seemingly, seemingly random expression of love and generosity has a resounding impact that reverberates around the world. It's not just a slow ripple effect, it's an avalanche effect as people feel empowered and heartened when they become beneficiaries of someone's attention and care. So now you have it. You've spent time in the incubator of the University of Guelph taking in what the wonderful instructors and staff have conveyed to you. Now that you're about to graduate, it's time to pay it forward. It sounds like a trite phrase and platitude, but it's absolutely true. You and you and you and me can change the world. How? With random acts of courage, kindness, and unconditional, unconditional love, noticing someone else's misfortune, and instead of just shaking your, hand, your head, you lend out your hand. That hand 
can and will join with other hands throughout the world to make this world a better place for all. Thank you. You may be seated. Good morning. I am delighted to officially open this 2017 University of Guelph Convocation Ceremony and welcome everyone here. President Vaccarino, members of the board, honorary fellows, faculty and staff, family and friends of the graduates. Today, as we celebrate the achievements of our graduating students, I'd like to offer particular welcome to our convocation speaker, Evan Fraser. He will be introduced to you shortly. My name is Martha Billis, and I have the honor of serving as chancellor here at the University of Guelph. And what an honor it is to be here today, back at the University of Guelph, my alma mater. I think back to when I was in your shoes, proud to be a Mac Institute grad and anxious to take the next challenge around the corner. Problem is, we do not always know what's coming or how we're going to get there. Today, I want to instill in you a belief my dean, Margaret McCrady, instilled in me years ago. She was full of advice. But most often, she said, remember, ladies, you are Mac girls, and Mac girls can do anything. And she was right. I stand before you today to proudly and confidently tell you that the education I received here gave me the wherewithal to go out and strive beyond what I thought I was capable of. Since the days of its founding colleges, the University of Guelph has been a leader in practical education focused on the whole person. The university has fostered an environment that encourages its community of students to aim higher, to make things better, to be more productive, to turn preconceived notions on their head, to make a difference, to improve life. My education opened doors and offered windows on the world I could not have imagined. Half a century later, those things are still happening here at this fantastic institution. Graduates, your windows are waiting. It's your turn. Your turn to make a difference, to improve life, for ourselves and for others. I know you can do it because you are, after all, a University of Guelph graduate. And you can do anything. Good luck and thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Franco Vaccarino, and I have the honor and the privilege of serving as the president and vice chancellor of this great university. So first off, graduates, this is your big day. You've worked hard, you've persevered, and you've made it. Well done and well deserved. Think fast, think fast. We've all heard that expression. We don't very often hear anyone tell you to think slow, 
Think slow. My main message today is twofold. Think fast and think slow. As a psychologist, professor of psychology here, I've, I'm of course interested in cognitive neuroscience as well as cognitive science and neurosciences in general. And speaking as well as a parent of university-aged children, I believe that your minds are different from those of your parents' generation. We see how you absorb information and how you interact with and through information technology in unprecedented ways. Young people are very, very, very good at coping with lots of information and shifting their attention. Your brains have fundamentally adapted to a very fast-paced world. Today we're navigating a river of knowledge, one that's growing larger and faster and flowing faster all the time. New ideas come at us at an unprecedented pace, new innovations, new ways to connect the dots and understand the world. We need to process more and more information in the same amount of time. We need to think faster. We might call this fast thinking reactive thinking. Reactive thinking is a sort of tactical thinking. It helps, it's what helps a driver negotiate the twists and turns on a road from moment to moment. But of course, there's another kind of thinking, reflective thinking or slow thinking. It takes a more strategic view, a more long-term view. Not that I'm suggesting that you think more slowly in the literal sense. I'm talking about a different kind of thought, different way of thinking than tactical or reactive. In our fast-paced world, universities are increasingly important places for both kinds of thinking. Reactive thinking or fast thinking that addresses what I would say is the now, but also reflective thinking that rises above the here and now to take the long view and also to consider the broader context, to consider tomorrow and to consider the day after. As students at the University of Guelph, you've benefited during the past few years from an environment that has challenged your thinking, an environment that nurtures freedom of thought and expression and inquiry, an environment that promotes and supports openness to new ideas, one that invites varied perspectives on a problem or opportunity. We've tried to encourage you to exercise both reactive as well as reflective thinking. We stress the kind of thinking that enables you to not just provide the right answers, but importantly, to also ask the right questions. We've looked to nurture thinking that is disciplined and thinking that is interdisciplinary, that draws upon your diverse experiences and draws upon varied perspectives and points of view. That kind of thinking is even more important in a world where challenges and opportunities we face are larger and more complex than ever. Now, big problems and big opportunities also need lots of minds thinking together on solutions. And I would say not just like minds, not like minds, but also unlike minds. Unlike minds from varied perspectives, from different backgrounds. You know, there's a proverb uh, that I very much like, and it goes something like this. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. So you're about to explore and discover the next phase of your lives, including, I hope, finding ways to improve life for others around you and the wider world. Go together, think fast, and think slow. Thank you very much. Congratulations. I am pleased to invite Evan Fraser, director of the Errol Food Institute, to now give the convocation address. <sighs> Having fun? Hi, Alex. Nice to see you. So I get the opportunity of giving the last lecture, which is an enormous privilege to be able to stand up here and say one last thing to you folks. And I'd like to open, if you will, with a dramatic and maybe even apocalyptic image. So let's start by imagining a tidy farm nestled on a prairie, and then let's add a few chickens scratching in a yard and maybe a cow in a pasture. Now we have to add some people to this image, so let's put a dad and some farm hands working on a tractor, maybe plowing a field, 
a handful of children maybe playing in a farmyard or doing some chores. And uh, this, this farm is from a while ago, so we're going to put the mom hanging out some laundry nearby. The landscape that I'm imagining is productive, but dry. And if we zoom in and look at the people's faces, although this looks stable, actually we see signs of hardship. The parents' faces are gaunt and careworn, and the children's clothing has been patched and repatched and re-repatched. So now let's add a little bit of drama, and let's imagine this wind picking up, and on the horizon of this image, a dark smudge appears. The smudge moves quickly across the landscape, bearing down, and as it does, the wind howls. As a dark smudge arrives at the farmhouse, it resolves into a towering wall of sand. It goes from horizon to horizon and stretches up as far as you can see. The dust storm has arrived. So the scene that I've just painted for you comes from American history, 1930s. Canada had a little bit of this as well. When a bad drought hit the Midwest, causing the topsoil to be loosed, generating hundreds of these sort of dust storms. According to one commentator from the time, when a storm of like this hit, the impact was like having a shovel full of fine sand hurled at your face. People caught in their own yards had to grope for their doorsteps, trying to find their way back to their houses. Cars would come to a standstill for, quote, no light in the world can penetrate such swirling murk. So the Dust Bowl of the 1930s is often seen as one of North America's biggest natural disasters. And it gave rise to an enormous portfolio of policies designed to protect farmland and prevent such a thing from ever happening again. The lesson that I take from the Dust Bowl is that the Dust Bowl itself wasn't inevitable. Certainly there was a bad drought in the 1930s, but it was the unsustainable farming practices of the 1920s that created the conditions where the drought was able to destroy people's homes and ruin lives. And it's this lesson, which picks up on things you've already heard this morning, that I'd like to pick up today. Almost inevitably, good and bad things in this world, even things like natural disasters, are not inevitable. So as you may as have guessed from this little introduction, my own area of expertise is climate change, agriculture, and food security. And I have the very great privilege of spending my days working with spectacular students, some of which are here right now. Uh, I work with industry leaders and scientists, I, I work with uh, policymakers, all sort of trying to figure out ways of creating systems that will allow us, to, us, allow us to sustainably, equitably produce and distribute food for the world's growing population without destroying the ecosystems and the environment on which we depend. And in my own work, I've looked at sort of careful studies of history. Things like the Dust Bowl, but also cases like the Ethiopian famine of the 1980s, where close to 400,000 people died. Or the Irish potato famine. Many families from this room probably came to North America as a result of that. A quarter of Ireland's population died or lost their homes in the 1840s. And from this, less, this work that I've done, two key lessons stand out. And the first is really, really pessimistic, so I'm going to move quickly through it, because today's not the day to be too, too morose. These bad stories of history illustrate how high the stakes are when we fail to steward the life support systems like the environment on which we all depend. And of course, this has to be worrying to all of us as we look across a 21st century where we think that climate change and water scarcity and rising demand for food due to population growth are going to make the world harder to live in. But the second lesson, and the really important lesson, I think, for today anyways, is actually much more optimistic. History tells us that the years and decades and generations of peace and prosperity and growth. These sort of decades are far more common than the years, decades, and generations of crisis and collapse. Overwhelmingly, the lesson of history is that humanity is extremely adaptable. We are so adaptable. And the crises, the, like the ones I started with, are actually the exception, not the norm. Of course, we're brilliant tool makers, able to come up with ingenious technologies to solve many problems. And in many instances, not all, of course, but in many instances, we prove ourselves develop, capable of developing social systems that allow us to work collectively. In other words, crisis and collapse are not inevitable, but the result of human decision-making and choices. Let me develop this idea by going in a slightly different direction now. Recently, I attended an event in Winnipeg where the Honorable Lloyd Axworthy was speaking. Dr. Axworthy, as, as some of us remember, was Canada's Minister for Foreign Affairs in the 1990s, and he's well remembered for his humanitarian work around issues like refugees, child soldiers, and he was instrumental in creating an international treaty to ban landmines. 
In Dr. Axworthy's talk, he reflected on his decades of public service, and he made this point that I think is worth examining. He made the point that when we look around the world and see both good and bad things, almost invariably those things didn't occur by chance. When we see a refugee crisis or humanitarian disaster, when we look at poverty or sexism, racism, or the impression of entire groups, we see, the, see these things as reflections of, or outcomes of deliberate decisions. Decisions or choices not to respect each other or to look the other way. Similarly, and equally important, when we see things that work, things like beautiful cities that exist as testaments to human ingenuity and creativity, or well-functioning governance systems that protect the poor and the marginal, we also see the outcome of deliberate decisions. Invariably, these things are the result of people, like us, hard at work who share a common vision of what humanity can achieve. So it's the sense that good and, good and bad are not inevitable, but are the product of decision-making that I'd really like you to carry with you as you leave the University of Guelph and embark on whatever that next step in the road of life holds. We must not take our ability to adapt, our ability to create new technologies, our ability to develop work collectively to, for granted. And whether it's the environmental crisis or rampant economic inequality, systemic racism or sexism, if we as a species want to thrive in an increasingly hot and crowded planet, we're going to have to work at it and we're going to have to work together. So I, I stand here with a huge feeling of gratitude. I have lived an inordinately privileged life. I, I grew up in a, in a caring and loving family. I was raised in a, in a safe and supportive neighborhood. I've enjoyed a world-class educational system, have access to great health care, and I have never once known hunger. I really hope that these things are some things that many of you can say as well. But I'm not saying this to sound smug or self-congratulatory, but I want to acknowledge the decisions at multiple scales going back many generations that resulted in me being able to live this absolutely extraordinary life. I say these things as a reminder that we mustn't take things for granted, and I say these things as a way of trying to empower you folks, this year's graduates, so that you feel that you can play an active role in shaping our world. The good things and the bad things are almost inevitably the result of people making choices. Choices on how we raise our families. Choices in terms of what we buy. Choices in terms of what we eat. As we move forward in our careers, some of us will be able to make choices that may affect how organizations run, or how resources are invested, or how policies are developed. And my real hope is that the last lesson you take from the University of Guelph is a sense of both optimism and responsibility that you will soon be making choices that help humanity's ability to thrive despite the enormous challenges that seem to be confronting us from every side. So with that, I'd like to wish you all the very, very best of luck in the future, and thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk to you. Thank you, Dr. Fraser. As a historian of science and technology who often teaches in this room, actually, I particularly appreciated the historical perspective that you bring to your analysis. Well, everyone, now is the moment you have been waiting for. Will the graduating class please rise? Madam Chancellor, I have the honor to present to you these scholars who have fulfilled the statutory requirements laid down by the Senate of the University of Guelph that they may be admitted to the various and several degrees. I wish you and the authorities vested in me and in the University of Guelph, I hereby accept you for admission to your various and several degrees with all the rights, privileges, and obligations appertaining thereto. Will members of the graduating class please be seated? Good morning, my name is Ben Bradshaw. As the AVP of Graduate Studies at the University of Guelph, I'm doubly delighted to witness convocation today. Firstly, 
I'm delighted to see some of our 2,700 graduate students, including a couple of my own, complete masters and doctoral degrees following what can constitute years of determined study and research. Secondly, I'm delighted by the thought that some of our newly completed undergraduates might return to the university to complete a graduate degree with us. As such, I'd love to applause each graduate. Unfortunately, I have to exercise restraint and I must ask you similarly to exercise restraint and hold your collective applause until after the presentation of each of the degree programs. Of course, if you wish to express your excitement in some audible manner as your graduate walks across the stage, we will not stand in your way. Indeed, we encourage you to do so. Thank you. Madam Chancellor, Mr. President, I have the honor to present to you these scholars from the College of Social and Applied Human Sciences that they may be admitted to the degree of Doctor of Philosophy. Olabanji Akinola. Do you want to do it again? Ola Banji. Okay. Great. Hi, Michael. Michael Ross Corbett. Sarah Elizabeth Cran. Surma Das. <laughs> Steffi Harmon. Donna Holmes. Sarah Kafashen. Ashlyn Margaret Patterson. <laughs> Madam Chancellor, Mr. President, I have the honor to present to you these scholars from the College of Social and Applied Human Science that they be admitted to the degree of Master of Arts. Carrie Ann Marilyn Cornwall. Amy DiLorenzo. Olivia De Fresca. Justin Doran. Amanda Komjanovic.
Anna Kopek. Genevieve Lynn Lalonde. Alexa Mackenzie Cooper. Lillian Catherine Sarah Mitchell. Alexandra Terrian. Anne Margaret Westbeer. Asif Imran. Zalfuk Rodin. <laughs> Madam Chancellor, Mr. President, I have the honor to present to you these scholars from the College of Social and Applied Human Sciences that they be admitted to the degree of Master of Science. William Joseph Gillum. Rochelle Christiane Myrie. Please join me in congratulating all of our, congr our graduates. Madam Chancellor, Mr. President, I have the honor to present to you these scholars from the College of Social and Applied Human Sciences that they may be admitted to the degree of Bachelor of Applied Science. Karen Aitken. Kayla Alexandra Barrow. Brooklyn Lindsay Betts with distinction. Jensen Alexandra Bradfield. Zoe Chartrand with distinction. <laughs> Allison Ann Colton with distinction. Cassidy Lynn Connolly. Rebecca Rose Cowie with distinction. <laughs> Katie Creighton. Sarah Grace Crittenden. Anna Virginia Davis. <laughs> Anna 
Jasmine Stephanie Demi. Kelsey Ann Dobson. Emily Ann Donkers. Amy Fang. Emily Gigoni with distinction. Alexandra Anna Jean Blasco. Ashley Grattan. Danielle Catherine Green. <laughs> Amanda Marie Hemerich with distinction. Emily Jane Jenin. Catherine Elizabeth Kutzner with distinction. Taylor Julia Leist with distinction. <laughs> Margaret Catherine Lee. Sarah McDowell. <laughs> Kathleen McKinnon. <laughs> Sarah Jane Mason with distinction. Christina Ashley McKinley. <laughs> Brittany Carolina Oostinger. <laughs> Mackenzie Victoria Panabaker. Emily Nicole Pitts with distinction. Oh Rebecca Vida May Posthumous. Yeah. Rebecca Suzanne Price with distinction. Oh Anjali Cabez Reynac. Caitlin Maria Reynas. Julianne Richards with distinction. Leanne Bryder Richardson with distinction. Lauren Nicole Rispecki with distinction. Cassandra Elise Shand.
Stephanie Lynn Sterrett with distinction. Bailey Jane Stevenson with distinction. Emma Janice Yelcha Sisuk with distinction. Danielle Martha Talbot with distinction. <laughs> Olivia Wanyu Tat with distinction. Marta Teodono with distinction. Megan A. Warren with distinction. <laughs> Sean Warren with distinction. <laughs> Megan Ann Victoria Watson with distinction. Caitlin Elizabeth Young with distinction. Please join me in congratulating this class of fine scholars. <laughs> Madam Chancellor, Mr. President, I have the honor to present to you these scholars from the College of Social and Applied Human Sciences that they may be admitted to the degree of Bachelor of Arts Honors. Shauna Jean Baudouin with distinction. <laughs> Holly Andrea Bucknam. Benjamin Zachary Baker Burley. Carly Ann Connolly. Ryan Terence Keith Dickerson. Jacqueline Grossi. <laughs> Anna Hughes. Joyce Kaur Kang with distinction. Jamie Lynn Cooey. <laughs> Kayla Marie Echo McKay with distinction. <laughs> Colleen Nicole Milne with distinction. Kelsey Ashley Seguin. Mallory Patricia Smith. Rachel Mary Soares with distinction. Brittany
Sydney Preston Stoneman. Please join me in congratulating this group of scholars. <laughs> Madam Chancellor, Mr. President, I have the honor to present to you these scholars from the College of Social and Applied Human Sciences that they may be admitted to the degree of Bachelor of Arts General. Alison Jane Ash. Maggie Jane Best. Ashley Deborah Connell. Nicole Jesse Dow, accompanied by Nessa. <laughs> Eric Ostenfeld. Caitlin Marie Pitts. Amanda Nicole Plantinger. Please join me in congratulating this group of scholars. Madam Chancellor, Mr. President, I have the honor to present to you these scholars from the College of Social and Applied Human Sciences that they may be admitted to the degree of Bachelor of Science Honors. Catherine Brassard. Samantha Kalea. Daniel Michael Carbon. Elaine Lindsay Carter with distinction. Christopher Chung. Cassidy Taylor Connolly with distinction. Gabriel Coney Bear Marsh. Brittany Perlin Danishevsky with distinction. Emma Jyoti Tamara De Silva. Devon Ashley Donnelly with distinction. Elizabeth Rose George. Anthony Joseph Juga. Nicole Greisman. Grant 
Mount William Hagedorn with distinction. Jackson M. Rishu. Mandeep Johal. Elise Annie Katan with distinction. Haley Katzman. Woo! Megan Olivia Kelly. Woo! Melissa Ann Copan. Carly Faye Law. Corey Lou with distinction. <laughs> Jessica Marie March with distinction. Cody Douglas Francis McLean. Bailey Marie Prike. Stephanie Nicole Richmond. Samantha Roy. Lauren Elizabeth Sabaziotis with distinction. Luis Soriano. Rachel Melissa Subramaniam. Mallory Elizabeth Thompson Terry. Please join me in congratulating this group of fine scholars. Madam Chancellor, Mr. President, I have the honor to present to you these scholars from the College of Social and Applied Human Sciences that they may be admitted to the degree of Bachelor of Science in Environmental Sciences. Laura DeCoste. Gillian Ruth Filmer. Osborne Ling Hei Hung. Isabel Ray Bolger Males. Amala Zainab Rasul. Kelsey Ann Catherine Service. Denise Jean Vachon.
Matthew Waddington. Kelly Margaret Wildfong. Please join me in, in uh, congratulating this final group of young scholars. Madam Chancellor, I would ask that you confer the various and several degrees on the graduates listed in the program but unable to be present at this ceremony. By virtue of the authority vested in me and in the University of Guelph, I confer the various and several degrees in absentia on the graduates not present. Well, graduates, you did it. Congratulations. Well done. It's a great crowd today, I have to say. Well done. Well, welcome all of you to the Griffin alumni family a growing family. This week, you should know that more than 3,400 new graduates are joining that family. The University of Guelph alumni now number more than 125,000 grads around the world. As you can imagine, we're all very, very proud of your accomplishments here at the University of Guelph and, and really do look forward to seeing how the foundations that you've developed here as a student will support you in the years ahead in your future. We want to celebrate your achievements and successes and really do hope that you will stay in touch and remember that you're always, always welcome here. Graduates, you've made memories here, including today's ceremony, and remember this as well. You're a student for a short time, but you're a Griffin forever. Congratulations. So this concludes our formal convocation ceremonies. Uh, the college dean will host a reception for all graduates and their guests in Creelman Hall, uh, right next door. This is an opportunity, of course, to congratulate the graduates, and we do hope that you can attend and spend some time there. And now, the final word is from our chancellor. Convocation is dismissed. <laughs>
Just before you all depart, I'd like to ask you to join me in one last round of applause for the graduates. Once you've taken all your photographs outside, please return your gowns and hoods to the tent outside this hall. And one last note, we are hosting 23 convocation ceremonies this week. Waiting outside is the next group of families eager to see their graduate cross the stage. To help us prepare the hall for the next group, please exit through the doors to the right and left of the stage. We will direct the graduates out first and then invite the family and friends of the graduates to follow. Thank you for your cooperation. <laughs>